Marathoning is a term that we have here at Affair Recovery that really encapsulates the emotional flooding conversation that really should only take 15 to maybe 30 minutes to handle, but yet turns into a two or three or four hour conversation. I'm sure you've been there. You've started a conversation. If you're an unfaithful spouse, you've thought, oh God, where is this going? How long is this going to take? If you're a betrayed spouse, I'm sure you've felt your heart beating so fast it's out of your chest and you, you're playing connect the dots emotionally and informationally, trying to connect the dots and understand what really went on and you've been triggered and you're flooding emotionally and you feel your heart rate building and building and all of a sudden fear envelops you, the pressure, the overwhelmment, the agony starts to overtake you and before you know it, you've gone on this kind of flooded conversation where you're going back and forth and before you know it, it's two or three hours, it's in the middle of the, the night or the wee hours of the morning, there's been so much damage inflicted upon each other that you go, why are we even doing this? We should just give up and quit. Marathoning is also used to describe the situation where maybe the betrayed spouse will ask a question of the unfaithful. The unfaithful refuses to maybe give all of the information and now we're off to the races. Or the unfaithful spouse gets defensive and starts to blame shift or what have you and now the conversation that should have taken 20 or 30 minutes to just get the information out now is becoming this session of two to three hours and see what happens is this the betrayed spouse is kind of trying to wrap their mind around the information the and doesn't want to quit until they feel like they get their mind around the totality of whatever that topic is and doesn't want to stop because of a lot of different reasons. Some of them are you just want to get to the, the bottom of the situation and get the information. Number two, sometimes you're flooding emotionally, you can't stop. I mean, your heart's racing, you're in fight or flight mode and you're off to the races. Number three, because you feel like you have to prove a point or you have to get to the heart of the matter or four, sometimes you want to basically teach the unfaithful a lesson and really kind of take the information and use it for them to wake up to what they have done to you and are doing to you. For the unfaithful spouse, you don't necessarily want to end the conversation because you feel like you want to get your point across or you feel like you want to help your betrayed spouse understand that it maybe wasn't a, it was more like B, C, and D, and so you keep wrestling to try and say, no, 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 it wasn't A, it's B, C, D, it's all this other information that if you just will see, you'll understand that it's not as bad as you think, it's actually these things. Or, I didn't really do this, I did this, and so this is much better because it's not that, but the reality is, is that you are flooding, both of you, your heart rate is over 100 beats per minute, you're in fight or flight mode. You can't digest and process information. It's utter chaos. And so what you thought as, a, as an unfaithful spouse, you're not wanting to end the conversation because you know that if you try and end it, your betrayed spouse is going to stab you emotionally because now you don't want to talk. Now you don't want to communicate. Now you don't want to engage. And all you do is shut down, give up, pull away, stop, et cetera, et cetera. And it just drives both of you mad. When you're marathoning, you're not safe for each other. If you're going to marathon your mate, you're not safe. How does the unfaithful marathon their mate? Well, basically by preaching to them, defending themselves, bullying them with anger, bullying them with blame. How does the betrayed spouse marathon? By continuing to take the information which hopefully they've received and berating their spouse or hammering their spouse or using another tool that I think the betrayed spouse sometimes resorts to out of pain and out of hurt, not necessarily out of just this wicked heart to torment their spouse, but here's another tool which reveals that at this particular time in the process, you're not being saved. A tool, if you will, that the betrayed reaches for when they're flooding, and I, I certainly don't mean to hammer you, betrayed spouse, but this is something that happens quite often. It's called 
blowing their head off. And here's what it looks like. A betrayed spouse has a suspicion or thinks that there's more information and, and genuinely might be led to that or has a, a hunch of a certain issue. And so they'll say to their unfaithful spouse, I, I think there was this. I bet you there was this. Tell me, tell me this. Was there this? Did you do this or did you do that? And then the, ultimately the unfaithful spouse says, yes, I did do this or yes, I did say that or yes, you know, I, I was there. The betrayed is like, tell me the truth. Tell me the truth. I know it. I know it. Tell me. Tell me. Finally, the unfaithful gives up the information and now the betrayed spouse will basically blow their head off with shaming, attacking, harassing, guilting, condemning, whatever you want to call it. But they will basically use that information to basically let the floodgates out on their unfaithful spouse. The problem is, while it's understandable that you as a betrayed spouse will resort to that, it is not safe. And what it does is it creates the expectation that any time the unfaithful spouse shares, not necessarily new information, but just shares details of the affair that you are going to blow their head off. So it kind of reinstills, you know what, I'll never do that again. I'm never going to give up information again. I, I'm not going to say what I said or this or that because if I give up that information, he or she is going to just blow my head off with guilt, shame, and condemnation, etc., etc. Now, I know that that's hard to hear, but it's what happens frequently. And if you continue to utilize that type of communicative reaction, there is not safety. Before you hit that button that says leave a comment, I know that it is absolutely wrong for the unfaithful spouse to continue to drop new information on you and hold things from you and keep things from you. I get that. That's why I did the, the other video blog on not drip feeding because that really doesn't create safety. But as, as much as it's wrong for them to withhold information from you, if you're going to take that information and use it against them or blow their head off, it kind of reinforces them to not ever give you new information. So your response is, well, Samuel, what do you, what do you think that we should do? Here's what you kind of have to do. I would suggest that you take the approach that says, listen, I need to ask you some questions, unfaithful spouse. I feel some things and I need clarity on them. I commit to you that I will make no decisions after getting the new information. There are no deal breakers. I just need the information. I promise and commit to taking the information, thinking about it, or praying about it, mulling it over for at least 48 hours or, or 72 hours, and then we can come back and talk about it. But I will not blow your head off. I'm not going to shame and condemn you, but I do need this information. That is being a safe person. Now, if the unfaithful spouse cannot hear that objectively and cannot respond by taking that and giving you new information or asking, excuse me, answering your questions, then we have a big problem. What that means is someone is not willing to be safe. And if someone is not willing to be safe, the whole system breaks down. Now, you might say, well, Samuel, wait a minute, no deal breakers. What if he or she confesses to, you know, 10, 15 years of, you know, affairs and all this stuff? Well, but here's the thing. If you maintain the mentality that says, well, yeah, if you tell me that I'm gone and it's over and I'm done, you're probably never going to get that information. They're probably never going to tell you that because in their mind, they've already built up the premise that says, if I tell them that they're gone, they're done. So you have to be really strategic and you have to use a recovery plan. And that recovery plan says, listen, there won't be any deal breakers, but I've got to have the information if I'm going to heal, forgive, live with this. I commit to not making any decisions for at least, now in this case it might be, you know, several months, it might be until after the EMS weekend, it might be even a year. Every situation is different. But if this is about full disclosure, I think you have to say, I will not make any decisions until we can get into a recovery protocol and start a process to recovery because I need the information. If this is just, you feel like you have to ask some questions, to your spouse like, hey, 
Did you ever tell your affair partner that you loved them? Or did you, you know, ever say these things to your affair partner? And these are just examples. That information, I think you should be able to ask your unfaithful spouse and tell them, listen, there's no deal breakers. I won't use this against you, but I need the information and I commit to processing it for about 48 hours before we re-engage and talk about maybe this new information. Again, it depends upon the severity of the information. You see, you have power to be safe, whether it be unfaithful or whether it be betrayed. This whole series is about creating safety. And I know it's hard because sometimes it's easy to say, well, my spouse isn't making this safe. I know. I did the same thing. I wasn't safe early on too. But as I learned how to be safe, the momentum in our recovery doubled. As Samantha learned how to be safe in certain instances, our recovery time, I mean, we grew leaps and bounds. If you will commit to finding safety for your situation, I promise you, your momentum will absolutely increase to the point where you'll be amazed at how much ground you gained all because you decided to be a safe person. No one can be safe for your spouse or your marriage or relationship but you, you have the power to make yourself safe.